Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Nice to be here with you this evening. And uh, what I want to do is take an opportunity to talk about trail sustainability, which is uh, a very important aspect of what we do in the trails program, one of many pieces that we consider in the trail design and planning and construction process. So this presentation is an adaptation of a, of a, of a webinar that I co-presented at back in December that was hosted by American Trails, which is one of probably two major um, professional trail organizations in the country. So um, it was basically, it was, a, it was a training webinar for trails professionals on some aspects <coughs> of trail sustainability and some of the fundamentals and principles. And, uh, and we saw that there was some value to have um, this presentation here and talk about it here in terms of what are some of the practices that we use on the ground, what are some of the fundamentals and driving factors that we utilize in trail design. So, whoop, this goes a little too fast. So, wanted to utilize the flood, the 2013 flood, as an opportunity to look at how did our trail system fare in regards to sustainability. So, really, that that, that flood a year and a half ago was a rare and extreme opportunity to <coughs> look at what trails survived the flood with little to no damage and why, and then to also ask the question why other trails were extensively damaged in the flood. So I'm going to take a, a step back from that for a moment and look at this multidisciplinary aspect of trails. So as trail designers, trail planners, these are the primary things that we're looking at when looking at a trail alignment or the construction style and techniques that go into producing a trail. So one is the trail sustainability piece. Another is protection of natural and cultural resources, the budget and labor implications of building a trail aesthetics and experience of that trail that it provides, and the community interests. And I won't leave it there just to kind of dig into it a bit further. The trail sustainability piece is the one that I'm going to focus on for the majority of this presentation. But um, to touch base on the others, for natural and cultural resources, it's important for um, OSMP to coordinate with our natural and cultural resource staff to identify potential sensitive resources and do what we can to minimize potential impacts to those resources in the, when we come up with a trail alignment. The budget and labor aspect of it is very big. And what I'm going to touch base on that kind of ties in with that later in the presentation is that when we do sustainable trail design and construction, we end up with a product that typically will, you know, according to some of the data out there, will cost us in a 50-year life, lifespan perspective um, up to five times or 20 times less than um, non-sustainable trail alignments. And then the other two are very closely related, the community interest and the aesthetics and the experience that the trail provides. And really incorporating those perspectives into the alignment and um, doing what we can to meet the needs and the desires of the community that will be using the trail system. And whether that be specific for hikers or for mountain bikers or for equestrians, you know, or aesthetic aspects of the trail, thinking of those particular aspects in the design process as well. So the role of the trail designer. So we have several folks on, on staff who do trail design and we pull in some outside resources from time to time. And it's really taking those five um, disciplines, if, if you will, trail sustainability, natural and cultural resources, budget and labor, aesthetics and user experience and community interest. And that's all information that, uh, that goes to the trail designer, that the trail designer holds. And then they, trail design happens in the field. It's a, it's a field exercise. Uh, maps and GPS units and, um, and other <coughs> tricks and toys help us with that process, but we do it in the field and we come up with proposed alignments or alternatives to bring to the table for consideration. I um, also wanted to touch base on OSMP's trail design and management guidelines matrix. So this information is available on our website and this is some foundational um, criteria around trail management decisions based on class of trail. You can see there's class one through five, with class one being a less developed, more remote, more rugged type of trail, class five being a, a more developed um, type of trail, and also looking at different user groups, hiking, biking, and equestrian, and a lot of other factors you know, in terms of maximum trail grade, trail width, um, surfacing material, things like that. So this is some of the information that we use as a foundation when we're looking at trail alignments and, um, and design criteria. So moving forward, what is trail sustainability? That, that word sustainability gets used a lot in regards to trails. And um, 
what I wanted to do is talk about, you know, a common definition, what we think about when we think about trail sustainability at OSMP. And the definition that's on the, on the screen here is what comes out of a, a long-standing National Park Service document from <coughs> 1991 that, that defines trail sustainability as being um, a trail that supports current and future anticipated uses, has minimal impact to the natural systems of the area, has negligible soil loss or erosion from the trail surface, and requires little rerouting and minimal maintenance over extended periods of time. So applying trail sustainability and starting to look at how did our trails fare after the 2013 flood. So those trails that we have that meet our sustainability criteria really had no or little, little perceptible to soil loss or erosion from the trail surface. Really the major damage on those trails was at sites where they crossed drainages or where they ran close to or near <coughs> high flood water, where there might have been landslides, those kind of things that, frankly, trail design, where there's not a lot of things that we can do around that. So um, those were only damaged sites. <coughs> you know, they met sustainability criteria in regards to gentle to moderate trail profile grades relative to the cross slope and grade reversals. I'm starting to throw out terms and technology out there, and I'm going to talk more about those in a little bit. So those trails have failed during the flood. So this, this photo is from the main Chautauqua Trail. Uh, we saw erosion gullies from several inches to several feet deep. We had large depositional areas. All that eroded material had to go somewhere. Some of it probably ended up in Nebraska, but a lot of it ended up covering flossy vegetation on OSMP land. And they didn't meet sustainability criteria because they have steep trail grades relative to what the cross slope is. Again, I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, they had uh, existing erosion issues, and we had attempted numerous prior fixes and water bars and check stumps to try and keep these trails functional. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back a little bit. I'm going to, um, because I can tell everybody here is getting really excited about trail design, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more, and we're going to do a little trail design 101 here and, and provide some of the foundational principles and the specifics on the ground that we look at. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, sustainable trail grades, contour trades, contour trails, and grade reversals. So this is some of the stuff that we look at when I talk about trail grade relative to cross slope as a foundational piece of trail design in regards to sustainability. Cross slope is simply the steepness of the hillside. Um, if you drop a basketball at the top of the hill and let it roll straight down, that's the, that's the cross slope. So what we look at, what we strive for is trail grades that are typically one quarter to one third of what the cross slope is, is what's advisable for preventing <coughs> erosion. Um, so for example, on our top diagram here, we have a 12% cross slope, so pretty gentle terrain. Uh, that means that if you walk horizontally 100 feet, you're going to go up about 12 feet in elevation. And a quarter to a third of that, we can get away with about a 3 to 4% trail grade and expect minimal soil erosion. A little bit steeper hillside, 25% cross slope. We can go 6, 7, maybe an 8% grade on that and expect very little erosion. And then a 50% cross slope, a pretty steep hillside, we can go about 10%. And the math tells us we can go maybe 16 or 17% grades, much steeper, but we cap out at 10% because that's really a maximum that we can look at before we start to have a lot of erosion. So what does it mean? Does it mean we do all of our trails at OSMP in that way? No, some of them need to be steeper for you know other reasons within those five criteria that I talked about either or, or earlier. Um, environmental protection, we might need to go steeper to avoid a sensitive resource. Uh, user groups might be looking for a steeper trail to climb um, one of the peaks in the, in the mountain backdrop of Boulder. So we have to go steep sometimes, um, but we have to recognize that that increases our 50-year life cycle cost according to Park Service data by, it could be five times, it could be up to 20 or more times. So some other um, tricks in our trade, grade reversals are really a big thing. We've really Stopped using water bars. Water bars are maintenance intensive. They cause some other impact on the landscape. We maintain the many water bars that we have, but um, we're not really adding any new ones into the system. Grade reversals are basically their undulations in the trail. So if you average out all these rises and falls in the trail, we have about this photo is from the newly constructed Lions Lair Trail on the Wittemeyer property on the west side of Mount Sanitas. And um, it's about a uh, eight percent grade in there, but you can see if you know parts of it rise up steeper than that and then drop down a little bit and it creates low points in the trail that we can drain water and prevent soil erosion. So I want to talk about steep trails, fall line trails, and uh, contour trail design as well too. So this is a key aspect 
you know, this particular diagram shows a trail that is um, crossing this little drainage and climbing up this hill. And um, in this instance, this trail drops pretty steep into the drainage, climbs <coughs> steep out of it, and traverses a little ways, and then goes steep up a hillside. And all those steep sections where the trail's running more perpendicular to the topo lines on here are where we're going to see more erosion. So what we do is contour trail design, where we are, the trail alignment mimics the natural topography of the landscape. And that allows us to drain water off the trail much more effectively going back to a trail grade relative to the cross slope. And it requires that, you know, typically we have to do switchbacks and climbing turns in order to gain elevation going up a, up a slope. So one of the questions that we hear sometimes is, well, if we have to do that, if we have to switch back up a property or up a section of land, isn't that more impact to the landscape than if we're able to just climb straight up it? And in a short-term perspective, I would say yes, but in a long term perspective, I would say no, because those steep trails are much more prone to erosion. When trails erode, people don't want to walk in them because they're awkward to walk in. They walk next to it, causes widening, it causes braiding, and we see more impact. It requires repeated construction. Um, we have to go in there with trail crews and noisy equipment and move rocks around and pull rocks out of the hillside and build steps and try to hold that trail together. So it causes more impact from our activity on that trail. It results in off-trail impacts due to sedimentation. All that soil that comes eroding out of the trail has to go somewhere and can end up in, in waterways and just smothering other vegetation, causing disturbance. It's also an invitation for non-native weeds to move in to that disturbed soil. And then it also you know, likely will require rerouting at some point down the road anyway. So that, that's when we have to go and reroute unsustainable trails, that's a second time that we have to go back and design and build, and that's just additional impact. So. Again, we recognize that some trails on an OSMP system need to be steep. So summit access trails, climbing access trails, others where the community is interested in, in steep trails or where maybe resource protection considerations require that we have to go steep. And we have to build structures to support those. So steps, retaining walls, things like that that we have to put in. However, that's what we have to be cognizant of is that's a pretty high investment of, of labor and and money over time. So this is some data that came from Rocky Mountain National Park on 50 year life cycle investment in different trail features and what, how that plays out over time. So if we do basic rolling contour trail, what I've been describing as sustainable trail, you know, what Rocky Mountain National Park says is that's $1,350 per linear, 50 linear feet of trail. And 50 years later, it's still $1,350 because you really don't have to do much with it. It's, you build it. It's, um, there's really nothing you have to do in terms of maintenance. It's good to go. We go steeper trails and we have to look at what Rocky calls rock retainer bars or log retainer bars, what we call check steps, staircases and steps to hold that trail in place. And those have a higher construction cost of about five times more than rolling contour trail. It involves moving rock, setting rock, a lot of intensive work. And the 50 year life cycle cost of that gets even bigger. That's where, you know, if we're using like native log, we're looking at over 20 times the initial construction cost of rolling contour trail because of logs rot and we have to replace them over time. So that maintenance, um, long term perspective, is very, gets very expensive. So that tells us our, our little trail design professor here says use lots of sustainable um, rolling contour trail and be judicious about use of other steep trails. Use it only when necessary. So just some case studies from the flood. One is the Green Bear Trail. So this is a trail that we rerouted, we finished on in 2012, and has about a 6% average grade over the length of the trail. Um, located on pretty moderate cross slopes, 20 to 60% cross slopes. And we put those grade reversals in it. Um, that's about it. We really saw little to no flood damage in there. We had to do some minor repairs at one of the drainage crossings, but that's it. South Loaded Creek West Trail, this is the portion of the trail that's more a uh, single track as opposed to the, the wider kind of road type portion of it further down. And that's not a very steep trail, about average grade of 4%, but it's, it's too steep for what that hillside is and it, it climbs relatively steep up the cross slope and had a lot of prior fixes in it, water bars and check steps, and, and we had some pretty significant damage on that trail. Homestead Trail, a couple of different examples from there. We did a reroute project, two reroutes there in 2012 and um, on two different sections of the trail. The two sections that we did not reroute that 
that don't really meet sustainability criteria, those had some pretty significant damage. And the lower right photo is from that lower piece of the Homestead Trail, um, right by the Dunn House out of South Mesa Trail. It had pretty significant damage there. As opposed to the rerouted portions of Homestead Trail that meet our sustainability criteria, fairly minimal damage. We really didn't have to spend any time repairing those. So just another way of looking at it is it's an uh, estimated amount of crew time for a five-person crew, what it takes to post-flood to address these trails. So some of our more sustainable trails, there's a far upper piece of Toei Trail, Toei Trail that we rerouted in 2012 as well, um, and the Homestead rerouted sections. Um, really didn't have to spend any time on that after the flood. They were good to go. Green Bear, we had to spend about a week with a crew repairing one of the drainage crossings. Uh, Lions Lair on the west side of Mount Sanitas, a little bit of time fixing some of the trail that we built that crossed drainages, but you know about a crew week of time. Some of our unsustainable trails um, that we worked on either last year or coming up this year, the, the rest of Toei Trail, the lower portion below the 2012 reroute, we're budgeting about 20 crew weeks for repair and reroute to that. Homestead Trail, the section um, down by the Dunn House, we're budgeting about four crew weeks to address that situation. Saddle Rock, we put about six crew weeks into it last year. And Bear Canyon, we're budgeting about 24 crew weeks this year. So it's significant in terms of um, sustainable trail design criteria yield trails that required very little work after the flood. And our unsustainable trails require a lot of work. Question about that? <clears throat> so just to put it into perspective, say the upper TOEI that didn't require any work now, you did work rerouting it before. Did you do less rerouting work per square foot than if it had not been redone and then would have flooded out? In a sense, does the flooding make it far worse to have to do rerouting? Um, or is it just six one half dozen the other? It's in terms of does the flood make the reroute, the portion that has to be rerouted, does that make that more work? Yep. Um, it makes it more work in terms of the restoration of the old trail um, and trying to recontour that trail and get that back to a natural condition. Okay. So in terms of you know building a reroute and whether or not had we rerouted the entire thing three years ago versus the part that we're rerouting this year, um, I wouldn't see a big difference there, but the restoration aspect is, is different. Okay, thank you. So, <coughs> Where does this information come from? So our staff, pretty experienced. We, and we try to stay really up to date on current standards and, and new things that come up in trail design and construction. We attend annual conferences through American Trails and Professional Trail Builders Association, which are really the two major um, entities in the country for, for professional trail builders. So different workshops with them and folks go to those and bring back new tricks and techniques for us to utilize and we're actively using those. Um, we, we try to team up with some other agencies in the area and learn from them and share knowledge. We do some stuff with, with um, the, the trails lead at El Dorado Canyon State Park and have learned a lot from him and he's been learning a lot from us. So there's an opportunity there for us to share knowledge and you know, as well as you know, getting together with folks from you know, trail staff from Boulder County Open Space or Jefferson County Open Space opportunities to share knowledge and ideas as well. And also just a lot of on-the-ground experience. We've got a couple of our trail staff have been at OSMP over 20 years. Um, we've got uh, two of my other staff have been here for about seven years now. And uh, we have two incoming staff starting Monday, which then brings about 10 years of experience from Park Service, Forest Service, and other land agencies and nonprofits. So a lot of, lot of experience there and a lot of continued growth and knowledge. And one of the things that we're actively working on this year is developing a a standards and specifications manual and documenting those specs and standards that we utilize in trail design and construction. So that's something we'll look forward to having completed later in the year. So just to synthesize some take home lessons from this is that trail design is a thoughtful and multidisciplinary process that's carried out by, by trails professionals. Um, sustainable trail, trails really weathered the flood far better than, than our steep trails did. Moderate grades typically are more sustainable. Sustainable trails, uh, as, as evidenced by data at Rocky Mountain National Park, can be more cost effective over time on a pretty significant scale. And then we also recognize that some trails need to exceed sustainable criteria and need to be steep due to, like I said earlier, either desired user experiences or resource protection or other considerations. And therefore, you know, we're, we always do that and we do it every year and we, we do it quite a bit, but it's something that we try to do very judiciously. Happy to answer any questions. <laughs>